So for the first three years, it was torture. I, I was having imposter syndrome left and right. Like we would write the material and I was great. I, I was like, oh, this is really good. And then when it was time to get in front of the camera, I would have such a fight going on in my head. Like those little negatrons in the head were like, you can't do this. What are you doing? Mm. Who do you think you are? Blah, 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 blah. Hi everyone, I'm Ruthie Otero and I have the pleasure and honor of being here today with Lydia Nicole, the creator, the producer, and the face of Common Sense Mamita for her launching of her 10th season of her blog series on YouTube. Which is now known as Lydia Nicole Live. Nice, and we're gonna get to how that evolution happened. So Lydia, yes. how does it feel to be entering the 10th year of your series? I have to tell you, I feel very proud. I feel like I've been raising this child and it's finally of age to, to do something wonderful. What is it doing now? Now it's giving actors a lot of great information a lot of assistance it is cutting through the garbage out there and just saying okay this is what you need to do <laughs> this is what you need to know because the other stuff is bullshit okay <laughs> so do this <laughs> But I would disagree with you, Lydia. I think you've been doing that since season one. So what's different from season one to season nine? Okay, so in season one, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. <laughs> I had a friend who was an actress who was always doing crazy shit. And I would say, you have no common sense. Where's your common sense? So I started keeping a little notebook of all the crazy stuff that she was doing. Like what, as an actress or as a human being? Both. Ooh. And so I was like, okay, yeah, you can't be doing that. You can't be doing that. That is not the right thing to do. You can't Okay, so be... as an actor, what was one thing that she did that was um, like, you can't be doing that? It was all about her outfit. If she had a 10 o'clock call, she might not get there until 11.30 because she had to put her outfit together. I was like, yeah, that's not going to work. Let's not do that. Come on. Set the clock earlier, get your clothes out the night before, <laughs> but you gotta think this through in a better way because this is not serving you and what you're doing is sabotaging. Okay. So I started with her in mind actually. Oh. And then I then after the first episode that I did or the first video I did, Elia Esparza from Latin Heat saw it and she said, we want to put your videos on our platform. After your first video? After the first that video. That is amazing. Which was, you know, you have to say the N word. Here are three reasons why you must use the N word. And so the N word was no. Wait, your first video was, was about the N-word? The N-word, and people were like, what? Did you guys think that I was talking about the other N-word? And the N-word was no. Wow, uh, that was smart marketing, girl. It, you know what you're doing from the beginning. No, I didn't, but that, was, <laughs> that just happened. It, it just, got you on Latin It heat. just happened. That's amazing. Yeah, it made me accountable. She said, so how are you rolling out the videos? Oh, we're doing it every week. So I was like, God, <laughs> I got to do it every week. <laughs> Because she was like, well, we want it. The first year I delivered her 52 videos. Okay, we hold on one second. Every... I need to know. How did you go from, I'm just going to do one video, see what happens, the N-word, and then you're churning one out every week. How did that, you go from basically zero to 100? Well, I had my awesome daughter, Lexi Grace, who had just Lexi graduated Grace. from NYU. And I had this oh. amazing young man who was assisting me with other stuff. And I just happened to say, okay, you need to help me with this video. And so what was great was he, was a, he had been a communications major. Okay. He wanted to be in journalism. Okay. So I could bounce stuff off of him. And he was young, and so I could say, well, what do you think about this? you think young people like this or they don't like this? We would do uh, spitball sessions, and we would come up with maybe six to ten ideas and script them out, and then we would shoot every couple of months. We would shoot a bunch of them so that every week we were editing. Because, first of all, I didn't have that kind of time that I could every week just shoot a video. So I had to think in terms of what was cost effective time wise for mm -hmm, me mm -hmm. to do. So that's what we started doing. We started with one camera, one uh, light that I got from the dumpster 
and a bed sheet. And then my friend's daughter, who was getting into makeup, Chloe Vega, started doing my makeup and also oh. started helping uh, with the little set. We had nothing, but she created like a little set. And then my daughter, we were watching Creative Live, which is a incredible channel which is what gave me the impetus to go you know what i could do this creativelive.com is all about supporting artists chase jarvis who started creative live did it so that um, artists didn't have to pay so much money to colleges and they could still get the information they needed i was already consuming it for like a year just watching all this stuff go oh my god and because of it i ventured out and got a DSLR camera. And you could watch the classes for free when they came out live the first time mm -hmm. or watch a portion of it right. after the second time or a smaller portion or whatever. And if you really liked that course, then you could buy it. So it was really great. I, I really got a lot out of it. And then there was this guy named uh, James Whitmore who started talking about uh, creating videos. So I was like, okay. I'm going to buy this course, and then we're going to kind of follow, formula. you know, the formula that he's giving. And he mentioned Marie Forleo, so I started watching her YouTube videos. I was like, I'm going to do Marie Forleo, my version. So it was a culmination of those things. I was looking to get back into acting, and a friend of mine was pretty much negating my stuff, going, well, you don't have current ma material. So I said, well, I'll do the videos. That'll be current. That'll say I have something. So that's kind of how it all started. But Elia from Latin Heat was the culprit. You know, she made me say that I would give her a video every week. So I had to come up with stuff. And then I was couldn't figure out, okay, I, I do funny videos. Do I do inf informational videos? Oh, edutainment videos. Every time we did it, we cranked it up a notch. So originally, if I've got this right, you started with trying to help one person. One person. And of course, the universe was like, more people need this advice than yes. just one person. And then what did it evolve into? It sounds like, based on what you said, that it also evolved into an opportunity for you to perform and brush up your you know, resume, you know? Well, it gave me the opportunity to get back in front of camera and work that muscle. You know, as an actor, if you don't use it, you lose it. It's not like, oh, I took acting classes 25 years ago and now I'm great. <laughs> It doesn't work like that. So it was like, <laughs> I, I, even though I was taking classes and stuff, it still wasn't the same as being in front of the camera. So what was it like when you got back in front of the camera to do these videos? So for the first three years, it was torture. I, I was having imposter syndrome left and right. Like we would write the material and I was great. I, I was like, oh, this is really good. And then when it was time to get in front of the camera, I would have such a fight going on in my head. Like those little negatrons in the head were like, you can't do this. What are you doing? Mm. Who do you think you are? Blah, 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 blah. And then I'm looking at my little production team <laughs> and they're like on their phone. I'm like, oh, this is horrible. <laughs> I had to like, okay, just do it. Just do it. And then I wasn't getting any feedback once we put it up, like zero <laughs> feedback. What do you mean? What kind of feedback were you looking for? Anything. You mean, well, feedback in terms of viewership or feedback? It, no, I didn't know who was watching it. <laughs> Nobody commented, none of that. And so it was being exclusive to Latin Heat. So I wasn't getting any kind of analytics back. Oh, it wasn't on YouTube. You were no, putting it on YouTube. No, I didn't even know to put oh, it on YouTube. Oh, I was going. It was going directly to Latin Heat. And so I'm like, okay, nobody, I don't know, nobody's. Right. right. So the first year, of it course. was cricket. Yeah. And I'm putting it out there, putting it out there, and I'm like, okay. You know, and that voice was, just stop doing this. You, you know, nobody's watching, nobody cares. Right. You, stop. Right. And what happened? How did you get from I'm such an imposter? I, how did you keep going? I kept feeling going like because of my commitment to give Latin the, heat. the video to Latin Heat. Okay, that's one. What made you keep going with crickets, with no feedback? How did you stay motivated to keep going? I, I just was on a mission. And it wasn't until the third year. Three years, I was like, hey, this is I need terrible. to know what the mission was then. Because there's so many people who do one video, two videos, and like, this is useless. My word was important to me. No matter what was going on in my head, I promised to deliver these videos weekly to this platform. And so that was 
the impetus that kept me going. Got it. So it was your commitment. It was my commitment. And you're valuing your word. That was it. It's really good. Yeah. Nothing else. When you talk about the why, mm -hmm. why do you want to do it? Mm -hmm. Because I committed to doing it. Well, that that's really it. wonderful because that commitment helped you overcome, as far as I understand, it helped you overcome yes. your imposter syndrome. Yeah. It was big. I'm going to tell you that imposter syndrome was big like what the hell are you doing what do you know all that not negative stuff the negatrons i call them they just were showing up guess what i've got this fabulous little bundle just for you because you are a fabulous actor i got it for you so what do i got for you let me tell you what i got for you i got the pr cheat sheet which every actor needs you need to know how to do your own pr until you get that job where you can pay for a pr person then i have the 12 step audition that's another cheat sheet you know sometimes you get freaked out at auditions and you don't know what to do well my 12 step audition cheat sheet will help you and guarantee that you will slam your audition every time. And the third thing I got for you is the casting sites. I have a list of casting sites so you can go and just submit yourself for that next big part. How does that sound? It sounds good, doesn't it? What advice would you give someone who wants to start their channel or maybe have started it already, getting crickets, three views, whatever the algorithms are these days, what can you give them to help them reset their mindset to keep going? I would say you're doing the videos for yourself. What is it that you want to put it out, put out in the world? Having done stand up after doing it for about a year and always wanting to kill myself after a performance. <laughs> like, they didn't laugh. I didn't get what I wanted. I had a comic, Jackson Perdue, who, who, who mentored me. He said to me, you're being a, a laugh whore. Your job is to go out there and be of service. I always had three objectives that I wanted to accomplish when I went on stage. One was always to do it for myself and have mm. fun. No matter what, it was my party and I got to be the hostess with the mostest for my party. Number two was to figure out uh, what I wanted to learn when I was up there. Did I want to learn pacing, mm -hmm. uh, pauses? Did I want to um, learn how not to, not to step on the audience laughter? So I always mm -hmm. had like three different things I wanted to accomplish. And when you're doing that, you can only think of one thing at a time. So if you're thinking of the audience, you're not thinking of what it is you want to accomplish. So that started to help me. And I brought that into um, the first three seasons of, okay, what do I want to accomplish here? Stop thinking about the lie that you're an imposter and just do the work. Shut the fuck up and do the work. What I and love so, about what you shared is more specifically, you focused on things you could actually control. We think we can control getting the laugh, right? Oh, if I say the joke no. the same way I said it yesterday when it killed, and it doesn't, that is genius. I feel like that's a lesson in itself. For those of you who wanna do a channel or wanna do anything that gets so discouraging, remembering to do it for yourself, focus on a specific goal, and make it a goal you can act, that's within your control. That's genius, and thank you. And what is the video about that you're doing? Oh. Just be clear, what is this video about? Am I trying to help my friend? Cause she's not listening to me in person. <laughs> So if I here, make a video, video. Listen, just watch this again, <laughs> okay? If the story hasn't changed, you're still messing up. Replay. <laughs> Here's a video for you. And that, <laughs> that's <laughs> kind of what I was. Don't call me, play the video. Bye. <laughs> that's what it smart. was. That's really smart. Yeah. Okay, so that was season one. This is amazing. You got through the first season of imposter syndrome. Well, what no. were the challenge? No. Uh, uh, you, no, I didn't get over Whoa! Really? I After still, delivering for a year? I still had it. I don't believe it. So the the voices were saying the same thing and I think it just started cranking up a little bit more and then in season two I lost the young lady who was doing my makeup because I couldn't afford to pay her you know because I wasn't making money off of it <laughs> right. again we went back to me Alexi Grace and Vincent Smith and so we were just cranking out those videos. But what were the voices saying this time? Same, same thing. thing. And what kept you going the same thing this is my word this yeah, is what I want to do. Yeah it's just I gotta deliver 
these videos. What made season two different from season one? Even though the voices continued that spirit of excellence, like how can I do this better? We got a different background. We had two cameras now. Wow. And it's like, how can we do it a little bit better? What, what else can we do? So every time we were shooting, and we still do this, every time we, we shoot, do. it's like, how can we top what we did? That's so amazing. That, that helped a lot. You know, just as a motivator. Yeah, to just go. Okay, I had something in mind. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna try this. We still were were working. You know, and and Vincent was great because he he would be my script supervisor and he made sure I did every word I had written. Good, because yeah. he did spend time on those. Yes, words. and he was like, uh, that's not how we wrote it. I was like, <laughs> okay, Vincent, okay. So yeah, it helped me. I would get frustrated and I will go, no, if you were on a, on a professional set, mm. you wouldn't be able to get away with that. And right. you know better. What I have been taught as an actor superseded what the imposter syndrome was. Oh, okay. You know, it was like, no, you have to deliver the script as is. So your desire to be a professional, yeah, to maintain voices. to maintain professionalism. You know, it's like I am a professional, and I need to maintain it. And, and I learned about uh, making sure that you delivered all the lines when I did the film Max Dugan Returns, which was a Neil Simon movie. Herb Ross directed, or Herbert Ross directed. We were setting up to shoot, and we started shooting this one scene and one of the actors changed the lines mm -hmm. it was over they shut the set down herbert ross went off on the guy he said uh what what are you doing he says i'm i'm reading i'm you know i'm doing the lines he said those aren't the lines that's not what neil simon wrote and i remember sitting there and my mouth was open and he said we're shutting down till after lunch you go with the um, script supervisor and learn the lines. Wow. And I was like, what? Neil Simon, I don't think you'd want to switch his lines. Yeah. It was what I was taught in acting school and I got to see it play out on a set. You know, you're taught do the lines in the script. What are the lines in the script? Here was this kid who worked all the time. He, I mean, he was a, a working actor mm -hmm. and he had changed the lines and I think he got away with it on other productions and nobody called him out. Not to, on Neil Simon's no, watch. No, sorry, I no. don't think so. Yeah, Those and it was very carefully crafted. Yes, words. and it really just encouraged me and inspired me to go, no matter what the dialogue is, you do it. Because I had Vincent just on me. It's my words, but it's still a script do the words that are on the script so i think season two was really about just staying to the script even though imposter syndrome was still showing up i still didn't know who was watching i felt like nobody nobody really cares nobody's watching this but i was like nope del you said you're gonna deliver this so you deliver it so that was season two right so season two again sticking with what you could control was improving your craft yes and your ability to stick to the script so tell me your favorite episode in season one, either for good reasons or bad reasons. We, they were a little controversial. The first one was 10 red flags for dating. Oh, that's useful. Yes. The big thing right now is online dating. And then we had uh, take your balls back. Today we're going to talk about men taking your cojones back. <laughs> um, and of course, why you must say the N word. Don't you ever use that word ever. And then in season two, we had shut the titty bar down. What? Uh, yeah, shut down the titty bar. <laughs> I recently took back my titty. <laughs> and I'm here to teach you how to take yours. Hygiene, wash your willy, <laughs> wash your, your Got Virginia. It? Okay. Yeah, wash. <laughs> who, who let the funk up in here? Were these still advice to your friends? Yes, yes. And also about how to be a good neighbor. Keep your pet on a leash when taking them out. Everybody doesn't like dogs like you do. Some people are even scared of them. And if they get close to the wrong person, they might give them a swift kick like a soccer ball. We even did what not to wear after Labor Day. <laughs> White. Two. That's right. You got people wearing shorts, flip-flops, 
thongs. They're committing all sorts of faux pas. Hey, do you know that when you bend over, I can see everything? So I can't help but ask, did your friend watch these videos? I have no idea. I was just doing it. So your friend was actually helping. She was a source for material. She was, she was the catalyst for me to do this, yes. Awesome. So now we are on season three. Yes. Are we still Common Sense Mamita on We're season three? We're still Common Sense Mamita. All right, so what shifted in season three? What was the bar that in season? In season three, I still started giving the exclusives to Latin, Latin Heat. Heat. Okay. But I went to a NALIP conference. NALIP? National Association of Latino Independent Producers, okay. which I would go to every year. And that year, everything was geared towards influencers. They had shifted from filmmakers to influencers and people Ooh. were upset because it was like, wait a minute, this isn't our conference. We don't, we're not influencers, we're filmmakers, blah, blah, blah. There was a woman there named Ana Flores who runs an organization called We Grow Latinas. She was talking about YouTube content. Mm. And so I was fascinated because I'm like, okay, I'm doing the videos. Okay, okay, tell me what I need to know. So when she finished, I made a beeline to her and I, I said, you know, I need help. I'm doing videos, blah, blah. She kind of shut me down. She said, are your videos on YouTube? I said, no. She said, what? I said, well, no, I, I'm giving them to Latin Heat. She said, well, you better put them on YouTube. So when she said that, it was like, okay, Latin Heat, I'm giving you the videos, but I'm also putting them on YouTube. So that's how that started because I got information that was like, oh, you got to be in charge of your video. You got to pay attention to what's going on. So that started things in a different way in season three and then I started to get like a comment here a comment there once it was on YouTube once it was on YouTube I think I had grown my YouTube channel to like 70 people but I want to know how did you feel when you finally got feedback well the first feedback was not good <laughs> <laughs> which I, triggered your imposter uh, syndrome yeah because season three I had done a video on Bill Cosby. He had gotten busted. And I said, well, my experience with Bill Cosby was not bad. I had a great experience with Bill Cosby. Right. Should I feel insulted that I wasn't given anything? <laughs> so for a month, Bill had me meeting casting directors and studio heads to try to get me a job. That's really nice. But he never offered me a drink. I'm a little offended. Should I feel bad? Some guy was like, your video is horrible and blah, blah, blah. So I deleted. <laughs> Welcome to feedback. <laughs> I was like, fuck you. Bang. <laughs> You're out of here. But then I started learning how important the negative feedback is as well on YouTube. Why is it important? Because it's not the quality of feedback. You want to elicit feedback. It's like bad publicity. It's good, good publicity. publicity at the end of the day. Uh, so dealing with that. publicity and bad yes. comments yes. was one of your lessons. Yes, in season three. And how did you overcome it? Was it learning that no, any comment is good? All right, great, bad comment, no oh, problem. Oh, because again, I was watching Creative Live and I heard someone say, you know, keep the comments, mm. it's all good. I started taking a course with Sunny Leonard Doozy. Oh. And she was very much into do not delete any comments. So I was like, okay. I won't do it anymore. I'll just leave it. And it helped me to come back with a kinder answer mm -hmm. and not saying, mm -hmm. you know. F you. Yeah. You're out of here. Yeah, you ain't my audience. And from her course, I started to learn about stuff. In terms of what you learned from Sunny, what was the one thing you implemented that made a difference or that you focused on that year, that season? season? I needed a thumbnail. Oh. <laughs> so I you were just using what came up in the video. <laughs> Thumbnail, what's a thumbnail? Yes, and so I started learning about thumbnails in that season. Yeah, Thanks. thumbnail might be normal language yeah. today, but not back then. Yeah. I mean, we're talking over seven yeah. years ago. And, and I also started watching Sean Cannell, who was doing videos. So I was watching him and I was like, oh, he's doing something different. Even though I was doing the videos, I was also watching the people who were in that space who were really starting to take off or do stuff that 
was getting a lot of play. That's something I always admire about you, Lydia. You don't stop learning. You want to improve and you go to the teachers, you see what's going on out there, and then you implement. Because it's, you know, like Marie Forleo says, it's figure outable. Yes. You're just like, if they did it, do, 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 how do they do it? I can do it too. And we, that's really We don't need amazing. to reinvent the wheel. We just need to know how it's supposed to be. And, and just follow the directions. So Lydia, what was it, in addition to everything that you learned about dealing with comments and building your channel, did anything change about your format? Vincent said, you know, it would be cool if we had prayers, since you do prayers. And you're, she's an awesome prayer. Pray. We started doing Faith-Filled Fridays, oh. which were prayer videos. And we started doing little bite-sized, taking little pieces out of the videos to put on Facebook and Twitter. So you really started promoting the Videos. Then we started work. Yeah, then I started figuring out how to roll them out in a different way, how to get the audience built. So I started building the audience on Facebook. I started building the audience on YouTube and Twitter. And also, did you have any themes? That yeah, and then we started Hispanic Heritage Month. Mm. We started celebrating Latinos in the acting community and the showbiz community. Common Sense Mamita celebrates Latinos in media for Hispanic Heritage Month. Here's today's outstanding recipient. I started going into the Latino space in season three to say, okay, how can I celebrate the people that I know or the people that I know of that I, I think really did something important that maybe, you know, people don't know about. Right. So that, yeah, so I started doing that. Thank you for representing us well. Okay, so now we are on season four, Lydia. You are still going, please tell me by season four, you no longer had imposter syndrome. Once Anna Flores told me to put this stuff on YouTube, stuff shifted. Really? I didn't have time to think about it. My friend Kelly Kula, who's an actress who I was in class with, I had her come one day to direct me on the videos because Vincent, I think, was gone. So, or Lexi was gone. Somebody was gone and mm -hmm. I needed somebody to step in. So she started working with me. Just by working with her, again, coaching, how important coaching is for actors, just by her um, giving me a couple of notes, it reminded me of who I was. It reminded me, wait a minute, you're an actor. You've been doing this 20-some years, 30-some years. You know how to do this. Why are you panicking? Do you remember the specific note she gave you that flipped the switch? All she said to me was, have fun. It Triggered like, you. My body just responded, have fun. What are, we, what are we doing? She also gave me permission to let go of the lines. Ooh, nice. So then I said, okay, let's try it. I mean, I went back to the lines after, but the attitude stayed. I was Your confident. Mindset. It was like, yeah, we're doing this. This is fun. And I started doing it for myself. And so it didn't matter who watched, who didn't watch. Mm -hmm. I was going to celebrate Latino talent because I felt it was needed. Instead of complaining about what we don't have, I just said, you know what? I got something here. Let me just do this. That was the big shift for me. Season four, I decided that I was going to move the show into doing uh, like a little cooking thing and doing mm -hmm. my food and having people at the table, which Lydia's is a great cook. <laughs> thank you. Which was what I did. I loved having artists over at my mm -hmm. table and I would cook and then we would sit and we would discuss art, be it stand up or acting or filmmaking that to me is like a lifeline mm. to to stay connected to community to stay connected with fellow artists so i did that weekly in my life and i thought how could i bring this to this show so our first guest bill hernandez and enrique castillo i made all this food i set it out <laughs> We had the, I gave him food to eat. We ate the food. We did the interview. Enrique is an actor, writer, director, producer who has this fabulous book out called The Dead of Summer. Bill Hernandez, who is the CEO and publisher of Latin Heat, author, a journalist, an actor. But I, I was like, I can't do this every week. Oh, that's a lot uh, of work. To film it, I don't have the staff. I don't have the... Uh, 
people to, okay, bring the food out now. <laughs> I had to go in the kitchen, get the food, put it out. So we did that. And then you were the second interview that I did. When she finished at, at uh, NYU, where did you go? What did you do? So I started auditioning for commercials. I don't remember food, Lydia. No, because they had eaten it already. <laughs> and then the third interview was with my neighbor, wonderful actor J.A. Preston. He was the judge in A Few Good Men. He was in Contact. He was in Body Heat. What I was doing was guests on all the shows. I did All in the Family, Good Times, The Jeffersons. Uh, I got fired from What's Happening. <laughs> He played oh, Tisha Campbell's father fun. and Martin, Remo Williams, all these wonderful... But you yeah. weren't cooking anymore. But I was like, yeah, I, I got... So I had to get rid of the cooking idea. But I love that you experimented. Yeah, try You it. had an idea and tried yeah. it. It didn't work. Oh, well, yeah. next. I was up at like five in the morning cooking all this food so we could have the stuff, you know, and it's like... Yeah, I'm glad you let go of um, the cooking. I was like, yeah, I, I can't do that. And then I have to... <laughs> I didn't have wardrobe or makeup. I had to do my own stuff. I was like, oh, no. And I had to clean up before oh, yeah. I didn't have a housekeeper. I didn't have any. It's like, oh, Lord, this is no. a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, that's so, not really sustainable. No, it uh, wasn't. Idea. I want to do it at some point. When you have stuff. And when, you will. Yeah, when yeah. you're When staff, it's time. When it's, when it it's time, it will be. show up. At the end of season four, Latin Heat and Bill Hernandez did this incredible uh, night of young filmmakers at La Cultura de Arte downtown right by Olvera Street. And so we were asked to participate oh. on the panel and to give her four videos. That, you know, we did the panel and they, they were showing our stuff. And so all of a sudden they put up our video. It was a, a packed audience and they start laughing. They laugh. <laughs> Through the first video, they laughed through the second video, they laughed through the third video and the fourth oh video. God. And I had taken Vincent with me and we were like, they're laughing, <laughs> they're laughing. It was the first time we actually got feedback like that. Mm -hmm. So I was like, oh my God, the videos are actually good. Oh good. Because we had never been around right. anybody to see them. During the fourth season, when I would go out to Lat Latino events, I would have actors come up to me and go, oh, I'm watching, you know, I saw your video, and I'm like, puto, why didn't you click that you liked it? Why didn't you comment? Were you asking them to at your video? No, I wasn't, because I didn't know that you had to do call to actions. Mm. I didn't learn that till the fifth season. But the fourth season, towards the end, became very encouraging, because I actually got to hear what an audience thought about it. And so. it sounds like you started getting traction. Yes. With the community. Yes. Congratulations. Yes. That must have been awesome. You deserve it. Oh, Thank finally you. some feedback. So now, Lydia, we're at the halfway point of the 10 years at season five. Yes. What was the shift? Season four, we started doing the interviews. Okay. Then in season five, I decided we need to open it up and take it out. So... We were planning for the intro for season five. Okay. And I got a team. Vincent had moved to Sacramento, but before he left, I hired four young ladies to help me because he did so much. Wow. I needed four people. I decided, okay, we need to have a better opening. So we're going to shoot me in different parts of the city. So we shot B-roll of me going into the Beverly Hills Hotel where the wow. Polo Lounge is, walking Beverly, in Beverly Hills. <laughs> then we went to uh, Miracle Mile and shot in front of LACMA. Wow. Then we went down to Olvera Street and shot on Overa Street. Great. You want to stop and get a taco? And then we went up to AFI and shot, you know, there's an mm. incredible backdrop of, of me with the city behind me. So we did all this stuff. And then our first interview on location was with Ron Hess at Momentum Insurance, who does ENO insurance for uh, filmmakers. I interviewed him. That was my first interview on the road. So when the big distributor or the big buyer of the studio then finds that out, they say, well, you didn't have ENO insurance and this is already out there? Well, we could be sued because you have, a, you didn't block out or blur the logo of some company that you were filming in front of. And I had Bethany Fanthorpe, who is our editor. She was also manning the camera and another young lady 
Melody Gelson. So they were my team. We went, we brought two cameras, we brought two um, director's chairs and we had our equipment and we went in there and we shot the video in his office. Oh, okay. That was another new step for us. Later that year, we went on the road again and did a couple more interviews. At the end of the fifth season, we added another young man named Quentin Cameron because I regularly go into a couple of colleges to talk to the, the kids about doing internships. I talked to them about the, the importance of internships and how to go about it. And usually at the end, some kid says, do you need an intern? And I never turn interns down. I'll go, oh yes, I do. So how is it that you get your staff? Various ways. Sometimes they come in through colleges. They need to do internships and they'll reach out to me and ask me if I'll take them on for a semester, I've done that. I've also put out notices on um, Craigslist. I've gotten great people on Craigslist. When I got Vincent, I had looked at 100 people through wow. Craigslist. God bless you. Yes, sometimes uh, through recommendations. You know, I'll say, I'm looking for somebody who's a shooter, and then somebody say, oh, well, I know this person. They'll, they'll shoot for you. Can you recall any favorite interviews? Oh, the cast of Stand and Deliver. I have the pleasure, the joy, and the honor to introduce to you cast members from Stand and Deliver and our own casting director. And that was interesting because... Lydia was in Stand and Deliver. Yes, I was Rafaela in Stand and Deliver. So I decided to ask the cast to join me. So we ended up having about six of the cast members at my table. And Alexia had to be very creative in how to shoot them. It was crazy. We did it. I made her crazy, but it got done. And it, that is one of your most popular videos. That's one of my most popular videos, yeah. You just over continue the to raise the bar on your professionalism yes. and everything that you learn and what you bring to it. So interviews out on the street and interviews in season five. Yes. I was determined that if people couldn't come here, I would go to them. And how was that for you? How it was did great. It be on the street? We had to do a lot of preparation. We had a list of the equipment. We knew we were what we were taking. We had our questions. So when we got there, we didn't stay too long. We were very specific. We'd like to interview you for an hour and a half. Mm. And we kept uh, mindful of the time. So what was the biggest challenge in terms of going from your studio to doing it live? It was being extra organized? It was being extra being... organized. We all went in one car, so the car was crammed. <laughs> with... Like a clown car. <laughs> yeah, it was a clown car. With all the equipment, but we, you know, we did it. We, we, we did it, we were able to do it. So that was season five. Season five. And then the people, because you were interviewing people in season four as well. I started, season five was really all about interviews. Okay. Yeah, I interviewed comedians, I interviewed coaches, I interviewed artists. It was just bang, bang, interviews, interviews. So going from originally season one, I want to help my friend, to season five, interviewing, what was the goal? How had your... To help artists. Doing interviews, I could ask other professionals in the business how they operated mm. so that, you know, somebody who may want to be a stand-up could understand the stand-up process. From an actual professional who's exactly. doing it. Exactly. That's wonderful. Exactly. Thank you for doing that because there's nothing like yeah. a first-person experience. And the same way with filmmakers. I brought in filmmakers. I brought in actors. I brought in voiceover people. You know, just different, like, okay, who can we bring in now. In these interviews, were you learning as well? I'm always learning. One of the things that I started doing when I started doing interviews with people was to research. Even though a lot of them I knew as friends, it was like, no, I need to research what they've done. Watch a lot of videos to see what they said, because I didn't want to necessarily ask them the same questions. Or I heard something they said, and I go, ooh, that's interesting. Let me ask a question based on that. We also got to go down to Casa 101 Theater, which is Josefina Lopez's theater. She has done a phenomenal job. So that was great to go down there, interview her, and get the history of the theater, and then go to her restaurant, because she also has a restaurant down the street from the theater, which is called Casa Fina, which is great, like great, name. great food. And I hear drinks. I don't drink, so right. I can't tell you. That so was that another was one of your popular yes. 
that videos yes, yes. with Josefina Lopez. Yes. Why is it that you don't like interviewing people you don't know? Well, because I like to have a rapport with them when I'm talking to them. Because I, I want to know uh, the type of person they are so that I know how to approach them. Oh, okay. When you're dealing with somebody new, you don't know what might set them off. Did this come from an experience of yes. interviewing? I did an interview early on mm -hmm. of someone I didn't know mm -hmm. and I didn't realize they had triggers. Ah. And so I I said something <laughs> and I was like, ooh. It, they got and, angry? No, it became a therapy session. Oh, okay. And I was like, okay. I mean, I went with it, I did it, but I was like, okay, I think I want to stay away from people I don't know. That makes sense. You know, I know people and I know, okay, I know how they are. I know if I could play with them. I know if they're very serious. Right. I know. And, and I have had a couple of people that I didn't know that I did interview and it was great. But that experience made me think, mm. Stay away from new people. You also don't know if they like to commandeer the interview. You don't know. Yeah. A, a lot of you don't know. Well, it sounds like you have started learning how to interview, how to manage it. It sounds like the art of interviewing, really. Yes. Because you want to play. There's lots of nuances yes. to being someone who interviews. And in season seven, we did a lot of two-part interviews because... My plate was full finishing up making the five heartbeats. So you were doing the five heartbeats, the documentary, and so that you split them in two because you didn't have enough time to, to do well, more I couldn't, interviews? Well, I couldn't do as much as I wanted because my plate was so full. We had submitted for an Image Award and for the wow. Oscars and, you know, and just a two-person team. So... There, you know, there was a lot that needed to be done. So that season was really all about pulling out part twos, part threes of interviews and just putting that out there. So you got more mileage out of each yes, interview. Yes, yes. You had good. Well, we had a lot schedule. of footage also because I, when I interview, I try to go long. So you yeah. go deep. Yes, yes, yes. So now we're into season eight. You're doing interviews. You're already dealing with the Academy Awards. Well, and your interviewing skills are going, you are growing. Yes. What's happening in season eight? Well, season eight, pandemic hit. We went in shutdown. So I had to do Zoom interviews. That's all I could do. I couldn't even really do single videos because I didn't have a crew. Again, my daughter comes to the rescue and she set up the cameras. She for would, Zoom interviews? For Zoom interviews, she walked through with Quentin, who was our little cameraman slash director. He walked her through the process. She set up all the cameras. She set the audio, did everything. So I ended up doing uh, probably about 40 Zoom interviews for season eight. Wow. I just went crazy with Zoom interviews. Were people more willing to do Zoom interviews? Of course, because everybody really... was home. <laughs> <laughs> everybody was home. You know, they couldn't tell me they were busy. <laughs> we did a three-day Zoom shoot where we did 18 interviews in three days. <gasps> mm -hmm. That's one, amazing. One of our, yeah, so that was I was going to ask eight. you what you learned, but clearly you learned how to do Zoom interviews. And the Zoom interviews, how are they different for you as an interviewer? Well, first of all, the quality is different, right? Because not everybody is set up to do a Zoom interview. Their Wi-Fi may be wobbly, so we had some that they got booted off. We had to come back. So Zoom is a little technical. Technical stuff happens, and you got to you gotta account for it. Mm -hmm. You know, some people don't know how to set up their camera, and so they're like this, <laughs> or they're like the this. The lighting is bad. They're right, backlit. They, yeah, so you kind of have to walk them through certain things, and again, Alexia was brilliant at, you know, helping yeah, them Alexia. navigate. We'd be nothing through. without you, Alexia. That's right. My daughter is a master of stuff. So that was season eight. Season nine, we slowly started coming out. Of the pandemic? It was like, okay, the pandemic is happening, but we're getting our shots. You know, we got the vaccine, we got the booster shots, we had the mask. So I did a lot of, uh, a lot of prayers for season nine. I also did a lot of single videos. And when I did interview people, I didn't interview them back to back. So I had to interview them, you know, one at a time. Oh, okay. You know, you want to make That's sure awesome. everything was clean, that, you know, nobody came in bringing anything. Mm -hmm. And so it was a little challenging. So now going into season 10, 
I don't know what the hell we're going to do, but I'm excited. Because of the pandemic and the fact that people were talking to you from now their homes, was the quality of the interviews, were they different? Just because the world was so different? Were people more transparent with you? People were willing to talk. Anytime you have anybody willing to talk, you're always going to get something good. Victor Cruz, who's a actor, comedian, filmmaker, he had put together actor survival during pandemic. I basically created this document to create the independent actor so that you think independently that though things are shut down, that doesn't mean that you should stop your process. We were able to go through that and he, it was, it was great. You know, he was talking and he he just kind of opened stuff up as far as you know we're in the pandemic what we can do what we can't do how how we're uh, navigating through stuff so that was a pretty amazing interview you know for me personally just listening to how he was doing life as mm, a, right. as an artist during pandemic i interviewed so many east coast artists mm. that i wouldn't have necessarily had the opportunity to because again we had zoom so that was wonderful because there are so many great artists from the east coast so yeah it was wonderful like carmen rivera and her husband candido tirado they are wonderful playwrights. Mm -hmm. They work by themselves, but they also work together. Yeah. Gossip is the perfect structure. It has, yeah. Talking about structure is the perfect structure because it has. It has all these movements. Incident, yeah. rising action. And it has all these movement. That was just gold. I, I just loved interviewing them. And then there was Edwin Pagan. He specializes in horror films. I'm Latino. I'm a filmmaker and I always loved horror. And then one day I was thinking about those things and it, it, it sort of came together for me. And I said, wow, Latin horror. And he was great to interview because he's done many things as a director, as a as an artist. In the Zoom process, I did interview people I didn't know. Oh! And because it was on Zoom, you know, it worked. Yeah, it was good. The pandemic wasn't bad for me. Good. We were able to work with what we had. As you always have. You whatever's know, in so, your hand. Zoom is in my hand. Yeah, Let's do this. And it was that was great. You know, you're learning about Zoom and also as actors we have to learn how to do the selfies and, and do that. So season eight I also did a lot of selfie classes on Zoom with acting teachers that I probably wouldn't have been able to right. uh, take classes with because who has the time to go to the class? Come, you know, that's yeah. a lot of time. But because they were on Zoom, like I was travel. like, yay, let's do it. So it was great. So, yeah, so it's a wonderful process, learning, um, being able to turn the audience on to wonderful artists and, and to be able to share. And halfway through season nine, yeah. the name changed from Common Sense Mamita to Lydia Nicole Live because... <laughs> I started getting coached by Evan Carmichael, who is a big YouTuber who has over 3 million people. Wow. And I'm in his group. Well, I'm in two of his groups, but one of his group is called Movement Makers. And then the other group is called Brandalytics. And so at Brandalytics, he actually analyzes your YouTube channel. So we went through, he analyzed my stuff. He told me what was off. I was like, yeah, he said, okay, change the name because I don't know what the hell that is. <laughs> well, he didn't say hell, but he said, I don't know what that is. And so I was like, okay. And I changed it as soon as I got off the, the call. I changed the name. I was like, well, we're now Lydia Nicole live. You know, season nine has been wonderful because for the first time, I actually have somebody over me kind of yeah, saying, do this, you do this, you know, okay, now you did that. Now we were doing videos once a week, maybe twice a week if we were doing prayers. And now we are up to three times a week. We added merchandise. So I'm selling t-shirts, I'm selling mugs. And I'm getting ready to sell an acting book and a acting planner. Really? And a journal. Oh my God. Yeah, and a you journal. got merch all over the place. Merch, yes. It gives you the basic of acting exercises, what you need to know. Oh. Uh, but it gives you the business. It gives you the financial stuff. So it's not the planner. It's in addition no, to the that's, planner. This is a, a book. The planner is a supplement to the book. And what's the name but, of the book? an actor prepared amazing so amazing so season 10 so season maybe international 10. uh guests maybe because zoom the sky's Let's. the limit lydia nicole live your thumbnails are exquisite total branding rebrand which is amazing that's a evan carmichael thing 
mixed with Sean Cannell. So I, I don't I'm, care you know, how you mix my it, classes. Lydia. It is 100% Lydia Nicole. Like well, you've shown you. up for this. Thank you. you may have been influenced by these people, but you implemented and all the colors, all the work, all the effort, all the focus is 100% Lydia Nicole. So I want you to take Thank credit you. for that. And I just want to say one last thing that I've learned from all of this is to follow the directions. Mm. The last two years, that has been my focus, to just follow the directions that people are giving me. Just follow the directions. And that has helped me a lot. And I, I put that to my craft. You know, it's like, as an actor, follow the directions. Right. The director is directing you. Follow what they say. So thank you so much. And thank you for supporting us. And a big thank you to my daughter, Lexi Grace, and my team. Give us feedback and also let us know what you would like to see. So in future episodes, I could put up what you want. Thank you.